name of the Lord, friends and families, good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We choose to rejoice and we are going to be exceedingly glad in it. Thank you for tuning in to this channel today. Welcome to church. Please bring your faith. Bring your expectations over to this technology. We're going to have a great time together in the presence of the Lord. And your faith is going to be a part of it. Your expectations are going to be a part of it. Because when you bring those expert, expectors and those faith quotients, in quotes, there is going to be a greater pool on the anointing, greater pool on the incense and the atmosphere. You are going to be blessed as a consequence of it. We are going to be blessed as a consequence of it. So please bring your expectations over. Let us feast at the table of the Lord God Almighty. Welcome, welcome to church. Hallelujah, glory to God. All right. This is church at Heroes Mark. Heroes Mark is a ministry set up by God for the discipleship of the nations. In keeping with the instruction of Yahushua. In Matthew chapter 28, which is going to make disciples of all nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father. And all the Son and all the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you to do. And surely I will be with you till the end of the age. And in keeping with this instruction in this ministry, God's given us the great privilege to create a resource through which we can do that very well. That resource was titled the Online Discipleship Program or the ODP in short. And now the ODP is a set of studies from the Word of God, which may be sectioned into five major categories of studies. The pharmacy section of the Word, the milk section of the Word, the meat section of the Word, the water section of the Word, and combination meals. And in coming through the 2023 ODP, God's given us the great privilege to come through the pharmacy aspect of it, the milk aspect of it. And we are right now in the meat or the solid food category of the word. We are going to try to further the meat aspect of the word today with week number 38, Tunic Righteousness, part two. Hallelujah. We're going to be talking about Tunic of Righteousness, part two today, which is going to be in furtherance of the series that we started last week called Tunic of Righteousness series which is actually a subset of a bigger series of studies called the Garments of Righteousness as part of the solid food of the Word of God. What are the Garments of Righteousness? Well, the Garments of Righteousness are certain spiritual understandings that the Lord, the Master, Yahushua, gave us in writing to the churches in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 3, letting us know that certain actions of obedience will grow the believer's actions or right stand relationship with the Lord. In talking to the church in Sardis, talking to the church in Laodicea, talking to the church in Ephesus, Yahushua makes poignant references to certain actions of obedience that were there or that may not be there. And as a consequence of that, their relationship will be sour or their relationship with God will be a flourishing relationship. And he makes poignant references back to the garments of the Old Testament. In talking to the church of this year, Yahushua said, Well, because you're lukewarm, you're not covered with things of the Spirit, you're naked. In talking to the church of in Sardis, he said, Because your works of faith are not complete, well, your tunic is going to be sold. In talking to the church of Ephesus, he says, Well, I appreciate your sacrifice and your service right now, but because you didn't have your undergarment before putting those on, I'm not going to be accepting of your sacrifice. Talking about rule of righteousness, eat for the righteousness operations. And all through the conversations that Jesus had with his pastors, we can see that in the master's mind, he's trying to get us, well, you guys go back in the Old Testament and study a little bit more, and you are going to see how you can grow your relationship with me. <laughs> and if you want to take up that study by yourself, you're welcome to do that. It's going to be in Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 3. You are going to see how Jesus keeps on making references to the garments of the Old Testament priests. And when we stumbled on this revelation a few years ago, um, I mean, the logical thing to do, if you are going to be a student of the Word, is to take that command from the Lord or take that suggestion from the Lord. <laughs> we don't just want to wait for commands right now. If the Lord suggests something, come on, we're running with it. So he suggested that in Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 3, and then we took that suggestion. Went back into the Old Testament and we started digging deeper. What are the garments of the Old Testament priests? And in studying that, we discover that there are actually seven garments of the Old Testament priests. There is something called the undergarment. There is something called the tunic. 
There's something called a robe. There's something called an ephod. There's something called a breast piece. There is the sash, and then there is the torban. All the seven major dress codes were used by the Old Testament priests, and those dress codes actually have spiritual implications. And because of their cultural perspectives, the Old Testament people knew immediately when they put on certain garments, certain cords are going to be struck in their minds to let them know what the Father actually intends for them to remember. So when they put on their armor garment, well, the back of their hearts, they're going to remember, well, there is no treason right now. There is no disobedience against the Lord. There is no violating his instructions. Well, that's what that armor garment is uh, depicted for them, and that means that there is no nakedness in the life. Um, how do we know that? Well, Yahushua talked about that in Revelation chapter 3. Uh, the, the incident in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve fell from favor in the Garden of Eden, further proves that point that uh, a violation of instructions is going to strip you of your spiritual clothes or, in particular, your undergarment. So we got that understanding we applied it two weeks ago. And then last week we started talking about the, the tunic of righteousness, which are going to be certain wisdom strategies right now that the believer can learn to protect the status of zero treason. Because we understand that treason is going to be a no-no if you want to go places with God. And actually, if you want to make it in heaven. <laughs> that is fundamental. No attitudes of kicking against God's instructions. I mean, the God's, God doesn't tolerate that at all. <laughs> and um, this generation may want to think, well, sin's got to be something big and egregious before the Father can be intolerant of it. No. You go back to the book of the beginnings in the book of Genesis. What started us in the string of chaos was a simple violation of an instruction not to eat from a tree. It's not murder, it's not adultery, all kinds of madness just yet. No, no, just don't eat from a tree. And they went ahead, they beat something, they violated it, and God said, I'm going to toss you out. And the Father hasn't changed. <laughs> Even though the Lucan Gospel wants us to believe the Father has changed from the Old Testament, New Testament, hogwash, hogwash. He hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He says, I am the Lord, I change not. The God of the book of Genesis is the God of 2023. And when you believe that, that's going to give you peace because you're going to treat it with reverence. You're going to say, yes, sir, unto his orders. You're letting Luke from gospel of corrupt your manners believe the God of the Bible, not necessarily the God of the TV shows. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, the, the God of the Bible now tells us, especially in talking to the church in Sardis, Yahushua says, well, I need you to make sure that your tunic is not soiled. And we went back in the Old Testament, we saw that, well, the tunic is a dress, is a long dress, uh, dress of the Old Testament, which is white, which means it may be soiled. But the main purpose of it is to protect the undergarment, making sure that your undergarment doesn't fall out, is going to protect the status of zero treason. We started out understanding. And then we came up with what we call the tunic equations to let us know the spiritual implication of that. The tunic of righteousness will be the garment which protects all the parts of the body and the linen undergarment. Exodus chapter 28 and verse 39 talks about the physical characteristics of the tunic. And it's going to be equivalent to repentance and reenactment to complete works of faith to sustain the status of perfect obedience. We learned deeply from the church in Sardis and the parable of the wise virgins, which Yahushua talked about in Revelation chapter 3, Matthew chapter 25, and of course, Revelation chapter 19 as well, in Ephesians chapter 6. And with the combination of those four scriptures, we came up with what we call the tunic equations to let us know that the fine linen tunic will be equivalent to the bride's righteous actions to prepare herself for the Lamb's wedding. And then the Bible says the bride's righteous actions will be equivalent to the wisdom strategies to keep your lamp burning in the season of darkness. Matthew 25 talks about that. Revelation chapter 19 talks about the first equation. And then, if you put those two equations together, we discover that lean and tunic, tunic will be equivalent to wisdom strategies, complete works of faith, to keep my lamp burning in the season of darkness. 
So when Yahushua was talking to the angel of the church in Sardis, the pastor of the church in Sardis, and he know that, that, hey boy, your tunic is soiled. What Yahushua was literally talking about is your wisdom is not perfect in certain instances. You're wise over here, but over here, you act like a fool. Now, I needed to correct all of this so that some things do not die. That's what Jesus told him, literally. Okay, let's start from there. Turn to Revelation chapter 3 over here. In verse 1, to the pastor of the church in Sardis right. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. So underline that's so everything she's going to be talking about subsequently right next because they're doing something or they're not doing something. Deeds. 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 Important. Deeds. Important. Deeds. Important. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Therefore, what you have received and heard, obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know what time I will come to you. Okay, where, where is the tunic over there? Keep on reading. Yet I have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their tunics. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. Oh, so that's how we know. So the pastor has a sword tunic because his deeds are not complete. But some guys in this congregation, I mean, they got it, they got it together. Their, their tunic's complete over there. So that's how we know what a tunic of righteousness is going to be. It's going to be complete works of faith, which will cover your status of zero treason. Hallelujah. We talked about all of that in that last week. So what are those complete works of faith then? Well, there's got to be equivalent to the wisdom strategies that Yahushua talked about in Matthew chapter 25. Those wisdom strategies that will keep your lamp burning even though it's dark all around you. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 25, read from the story of the wise virgins. Ten virgins means that ten people, status of zero trees and just yet. But then five of them were wise and five of them were acting like fools. And the foolish virgins, during the darkness, during the midnight season, their oil was going down, meaning that they are going to lose that status of perfect obedience. But the wise virgins, even though there was darkness all around, they have oil in their jars. So when their lamp was going out, they're going to take oil from their jars, they're going to put it back in their oil. Oil is going to keep on, the lamp's going to keep on burning again. It's going to keep on shining. So... How do we do that then? Well, you got to be wise and learn from the strategies of the guys who have oil in their jars or oil in their vessels. What's the meaning of that? It means that you have inheritances pumped into your body. You have a personalized revelation. You have wisdom strategies to understand how to overcome the darkness of your generation. And darkness is, going, is not going to encroach on you. You're not going to be going on with the motions of everybody. No, you are stronger than darkness. And to be stronger than darkness, all it takes is just wisdom. <laughs> so, so that wisdom is important. And Yahushua now further, further states in Matthew chapter 25 that that wisdom is going to be wrapped up in what he calls watching. Now let's look at it. Matthew 25. Hallelujah. I'm going to start to read from, okay, God says read everything again, all right. Matthew 25 from verse 1. It says, at that time, talking about the time of the rapture or the time of the second coming of the Lord, because that's the conversation he was talking about in Matthew 24. So read, if you have the time, go ahead and read the whole Matthew 24 and flow straight down into Matthew 25. You can understand what the master was talking about. It says, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in their jars or vessels along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here is the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps, the foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. 
No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Therefore, instead, go to those who sell oil and buy for yourselves. In last week's message, we talked about, well, <laughs> buy oil before the midnight. It makes a lot of sense. So if these foolish virgins were to have asked the wise virgins prior to the midnight season, hey guys, you know, how did you all get that oil? So maybe they asked during the day or maybe sometime in the evening, well, they're going to tell it, well, go buy your oil and bring it back and maybe the master would never arrive. But they waited too late. They waited until it's completely pitch dark and the master is on his way. <laughs> and then they want to go over and buy oil. Well, they went away, but they didn't have no time. And then, <laughs> but while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later on, others also came, Sir, sir, they said, open the door first. But he said, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Wow. <laughs> what does that mean? They're going to miss out on the rapture, if the rapture were to have occurred in that season. And since we know the rapture is going to take about 40, 60 years, based on the calculation of end time snapshots, they... The, what, the, the, the application of this parable is going to be in seal four, because we're in seal four right now. Based on the end time snapshots, the seal four is going to happen. Seal five and seal six is when the rapture is going to occur. Uh, so the, the, the predominant population, the body of Christ, thinks the rapture can occur in a moment. I, I defer on that because I, uh, God's blessed us with a series of studies we call end time snapshots. We're going to be getting there, getting back to end time snapshot later on this year, sometime in December. But if you're in a hurry, you can go back to 2022 playlist and see how through prophetic statistics we know that the rapture cannot occur in this season within the next one or two years that people are expecting the Lord to return. It's not just going to be possible. There is not enough harvest for the Father. There is not even the subsistent harvest, harvest for the Father. But I'm going to drop it. But if you want to amuse yourself that study, go back to the YouTube channel or to the website, heroesmart.com, you'll be able to see end time snapshot. So what season are we right now? Well, we are what in the season called seal four. And the seal four season is a time when the Bible prophesies the quarter of the world's population is going to be decimated through famine, plagues, pestilences, swords, small swords, the killings through the wild beasts and all kinds of challenges in the atmosphere until about a quarter of the world's population is decimated. That's what's going on right now, but it's in a slow and steady pace. It's not going to be as a consequence of fiery decimation, which, which, which occurred during seal one and seal two, talked about in the book of Revelation 6. Now, what's happening right now is a slow and steady reduction of the world's population. Now, if you go to your world dominator, uh, the world dominator is going to tell you, well, the world's population is increasing right now. Uh, we're getting close to about 8 billion. Then they project that in the next 50 years, we're going to be about 100 billion. Oh, but I said, well, that's not correct then. It means the world's population is, is increasing. Uh, but if you start a little bit deeper and you go to another statistic, which shows the growth rate. <laughs> so there's a, there's a difference between growth and the rate at which growth is happening. They call that growth rate. Now, you do your search on the internet, you are going to see the growth rate of the world's population just nosedived. <laughs> so prior to this season, if you were to go back to the 1960s or even the 1800s, the growth rate of the population was rapidly expanding. It was rapidly just like that. But now, the growth rate, the growth rate is on a decline. So it means that the rate at which the world's population was increasing years ago, it's not like that anymore. And given a few years, the decline in the growth rate is going to make you know that the world's population is going to start declining, just like the Bible prophesied. Now, God intends to do this thing expeditiously. He wants to do it as quickly as possible. You know, decimate about a quarter of the world's population, get a harvest of righteousness, which will download the rapture, and then he can carry on with his business. But unfortunately, the body of Christ... Uh, who are the custodians of knowledge in the planet? They are sleeping predominantly. They're like Moses in the wilderness, 
tie in the father's hands and the father wants to do certain things, they're going to say, hey, oh God, don't do this right now. Hey, God, don't do this. And as a consequence of that, this thing may stretch out much longer than the father actually anticipated. But some of us are waking up. And <laughs> so while some people are trying to delay God's plans, we are going to try to accelerate God's plans by the grace of God. We're going to try to pull, pull the pressure back in darkness because I got oil in my jar. I've got oil in my vessel. I know what the Father, I know the heartbeat of the Father. I know what the Father wants to do. He wants a harvest so he can wrap up the age. But there is not going to be any significant harvest if the, 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 the so-called pastors, the weak belly pastors, they're holding God's hands. And God don't do, don't do something too bad for them. No, God has to do it. Why? When thy judgments are in the world, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Without significant judgment, they are not going to learn righteousness. They don't learn righteousness. There is no harvest for the Father. There is no harvest for the Father where the rapture will occur. That's what's going on right now. So what the Father is going to fix on doing right now is to accelerate what we call seal for it. It's going to accelerate it. Um, and there is a contention in the spirit right now. And starting from next year, I told you, um, some of you who were a part of the online service over here, uh, we are going to start putting pressure on darkness right now. Starting from next year, we are going to be generating significant incense based on the evidence of Revelation chapter, chapter 8 to put, to put pressure on darkness because incense is going to be required for judgment. And while the Lucrum church is trying to slow down God's plan, God's going to raise up a body of people to accelerate his plan. So listen, there's going to be a contention around the spirit. And, of course, that needs to happen because the house of David has to get stronger and the house of Saul has to get weaker. Now, that's going to happen, and that is happening already by the grace of God. And we're going to tighten up the news on this generation start from next year. If you're part of this gen part of this household of faith, we are going to put pressure, further pressure on darkness. Why? Because there's hard in our vessels. Now, when all that starts to happen, it's going to be close to the midnight in Silphor. In quote, what's the literal implication of that? Well, the literal implication of that is that the idols of this generation wouldn't work anymore. So the medical science wouldn't work anymore. Financial community wouldn't work anymore. And in that season, people are going to just be running out to skelter. Their hearts are going to be failing them. When that happens, you have to have an abundance of oil in your vessel, which is going to be a combination of the oil you need for your menorah and the anointing upon that you need to generate significant personal incense to manipulate circumstances and get your needs met. Not necessarily because you have a fat bank account on earth, but because you have a fat bank account in heaven. Now, what's going to make all that happen is because you're a wise virgin. Now, if what I talked about is going over your head, what does he talk about? <laughs> Come on. Well, this is week number 38. You should have started from week number one. But for the guys on the call, they, they understand what I'm talking about, just like that. Boom. They say, yeah, correct. That, that makes sense. Boom, boom, boom. They give me the Holy Ghost grunts right now because they understand what I'm talking about. This is a program, so if you stumble on what I'm talking about, I'm sorry. We're getting to the solid food of the Word of God right now. Please do not be frustrated. Get started with week number one. What I'm talking about right now is to is what's going to keep you safe and keep your family safe in this season of darkness. Darkness covers the world, grows darkness to people. Wealth is going to be worthless in a season of wrath. Only righteousness will deliver from death. You've got to think about how to grow your righteousness quotient. Your relationship quotient with the Lord right now. What's going to help you do that? will be the strategies of the wise virgins talked about in Matthew 25, which we encapsulate in what we call the tunic of righteousness. So Yahushua says in verse 11 over here, Matthew 25, later others also came, Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. You see that? So everything Jesus is talking about, this practical instruction is, you keep watch. Watch. Somebody tell me, watch. Hallelujah. 
If you're watching with me right now, type it into your browser over there in the chat session. Watch. The Father's, Yahushua's instruction to you, if you are going to be a wise virgin, is watch. Now, traditional Christian eschatology, eschatology, when they hear the word watch in the Bible, especially the Gospels, when they hear the word watch, the next thing they want to do is to go to their patio and start looking at the moon. Oh, I'm watching for the blood moon. Watch, Jesus said, watch, or I'm looking at the skies right now. Well, not necessarily. I mean, there's a, there's a time for you to watch for the cloud. We believe that we talked about it. Watch for what God is doing. But the kind of watching Jesus is talking about over here is to watch for the oil in your lamp. But if you read the context, <laughs> watch. Watch and make sure, well, is there oil in my lamp? Oh, is there oil in my vessel? Oh, is there oil over here? Why? Because I got to keep on burning, even though it's dark outside. And how do we know that? Because that's exactly what Jesus did himself. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he took Peter, James, and John, um, and he told them to watch so that they will not fall into temptation. In Matthew chapter 26, in, this ver in verse 40, Yahushua was sorrowfully when the garden, he started praying and all of that. He comes back and he saw the disciples, whom he had told in Matthew 25 to watch. And I look at what Jesus told him right now. In verse 40, Matthew 26 and verse 40, take a look. It says, then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you man not watch with me for one hour? Oh, so watching in that context is going to be going to your garden of Gethsemane. Okay, keep reading. Watching for one hour, he asked Peter, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Oh, so watching in the context, the conversation that he started talking about in Matthew 25 is going to be inclusive of you watching to make sure you don't fall into temptation. That's correct. And then we read, snooped it into the master's mind all through that last week, that, well, how did the master watch for temptation? We understood that the master, out of the back of his mind, he understood that, well, my spiritual status prior to the Garden of Gethsemane is not good for me. He's not good for humanity. Not good for my disciples. Not good for the Father. Not good for anybody. Why? Because he was thinking of aborting the plan of redemption already. That was his spiritual status. You read Matthew 26 all the way up to verse 40. You're going to see what I'm talking about. His soul was exceedingly sorrowful. Now he was not like that for the predominant part of his ministry. But toward the tail end of his ministry, he started considering the idea of aborting the plan of redemption. Now, we know how that happened. Peter pushed it on him, the rest of the disciples. Yahushua starts to tell them, well, I'm going to go right now and die for the sins of humanity. And then on the third day, I will come back to life. Guys, you understand that needs to happen, Peter especially, because you have a revelation right now that I'm going to be the Messiah, right? Did you listen to the Father closely enough? The Father told you that. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. My Father was going to give you a revelation, Peter, that Yahushua, me, the Messiah, I've got to die on the cross. You understand what I'm talking about, Peter? <laughs> and Peter lost it. <laughs> he said, no, boss. No, no. I don't understand that deeply. I just know that you are the Messiah who's going to come come here and kick out the Romans, and I'm going to be the vice president on your side because I brought, I brought 25 pounds of gold to this ministry. I'm going to be right over here. You're going to be right here. We're going to do business together. You're going to restore the kingdom of our father, David. Come on now, Yahushua. Don't you understand that? The kingdom of our father needs to come right now. <laughs> that was Peter's frame of mind. And he went and he called Jesus to the side right and started rebuking him. Yahushua said, no, i got to go and die, boy. Don't you understand? This is not a time for a physical kingdom right now. I've got to establish what the book of Daniel prophesied. Uh, can't you see over there? They, they talked about there's going to be a time for everlasting righteousness. This is the time for it. After 77s are completed, I've got to come and do this. Peter said, no, I mean, don't you understand? 
I left my job right now, I left my fishing business. I got a family to take care of right now. Can't you see? You cannot die. Why should you die? This is not going to be nice for my family. He kept on talking about the master with all his carnal ideas. The master looks at him and says, I rebuke you, Satan. You don't have the mind, the things of God in mind. You have the things of man. Get thee behind me, Satan. So Jesus casts Peter out and says, you get out of there. You're just a, a big, old, big old baby. You're trying to you know, put all those whiny things in mind. Get out of here. So Jesus casts Peter out. But the words of Peter did not leave Yahushua's mind. So even though Peter had been slapped, his mouth had been slapped away, and well, the devil kept on telling Jesus, well, you see, that's not going to be that's not going to be love action on your part right now. Mm -hmm. If you really love your disciples, you're going to make sure they're taken care of. Mm -hmm. Didn't you say you're a God of love? You say you love them. Look at what you've done to them. You, you're just going to die right now. What if the Father doesn't raise you up again? Huh? Do, do you have a contract that God says it's going to rain? What about the Father says, no, you, you, you just, you like, De devastated the lives of 12 people. Peter, James, and John, and all of these guys that left their flourishing businesses, their families are going to be devastated because of your stupid decision. You want to go down across the carpet. That's not love. <laughs> That's why the devil was telling the master, look at a big temptation right now. And Yahushua was all over just thinking about, oh God, what is the meaning of all of this? Oh, he just kept on telling, no, don't die, no, down the cross. No, it's too much for him. He can't do it, no, down the cross. And he got so bad that his soul was so sorrowful, overwhelmed. But thank God, Yahushua had his tunic on. What do you, what do you mean by that? He had his wisdom strategies on to push himself out of that. Ha! And that's what we're trying to study today. Because you're going to go through it as well, especially if you're making waves in the realm of the spirit. You haven't gone through this kind of sorrow or something really close to this kind of sorrow before. <laughs> you're not significant spiritually. The devil doesn't care about you. But if you're making waves and things of the spirit, the devil's going to bring some Peters into your world who will put pressure on you so much so that you got to learn from the strategies of Jesus right to push that pressure away. And Yahushua became sorrowful. Oh, this is almost killing me. Attacking his emotions, left, right, and center. I mean, not even talk about the things that his own natural siblings were doing to him. The sons of Mary... Uh, James and Jude and all these guys and then the Pharisees were trying to get him, the Sadducees were trying to get him, the Peter was trying to get him, he's on the same list. It looks like the whole world was against Jesus. I'm trying to paint a picture in front of me to know these are realities, guys. And we got to learn from the strategy of this, this person. But thankfully, Yahushua took his lessons seriously. He had learned before that when this happens, Something's trying to push me down to treason and it's trying to take me to hell. But I'm not going to let that happen. Hey, boys, I'm going to the Garden of Gethsemane right now. I am going to go ahead and press some olives. Oh, oh, glory to God. How do we know that? Now, look at Luke's account of it. I'm trying to tell you that this is what it takes to put oil in your vessel. Because the way they used to get oil in the Old Testament is they're going to go pluck olives and they're going to crush it. Right? And we know from Matthew 25, you're trying to get oil and abundance of it. Now, what did Jesus do to get oil? What he did, encapsulated in the Garden of Gethsemane. Look at Luke's account of the Garden of Gethsemane. Hallelujah. Uh, and in verse, in chapter 22, and in verse 39, take a look at it. The Holy Spirit allowed this to be documented for us. Because God knows it's going to be mapping back to the wisdom strategies of the wise virgins. Take a look. Luke 22, verse 39. Yahushua went out as usual to the Mount of Olives. And on a line that as usual. So he did it often. It's part of his tunic of righteous operations. But he didn't go to some other mountain or any other mountain. Specifically to the Mount of Olives. Why? Because that's where you get olives from. And you pluck olives and you crush it, you press it, there's going to be oil, you put it in your jar. 
exactly smack accurate with what Matthew 25 is describing with the story of the wise virgins. Take a look. Yahushua went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching that place, he prayed and said, um, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. So you need olives not to fall into temptations. Correct. He withdrew about a stone throw beyond them and knelt down to pray. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet know what I will, but you will be done. And an angel from heaven appeared to strengthen him. And he being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling, falling, falling to the ground. So the exercise of the Garden of Gethsemane can be called pressing olives, which is going to be equivalent to watching, which is going to be equivalent to the wise virgin's strategy of keeping oil in their jars. And that's what we call tunic righteousness. And we know the rest of the story. The master did this exercise in the, in the, in the Mount Olives one time, two times, three times. His emotions, he changed his emotions, sorrowful emotions became joyful emotions right now. He pushed that significant incense into that mind he could see clearly. And all of a sudden he told Peter, hey, my accusers are coming. I'm ready to die right now. Come on, boys, let's do it again. Hallelujah. Salute the master for me. Say, say, say yes, sir, Jesus. Now, come on now, salute the master right now. Yahushua, he is the Lord. You went through that experience and the Holy Spirit allowed somebody, Matthew, Mark, and Luke to document, some people to document it for so you can know how not to fall when tempted. Because it's going to come on you. It's called milestones. It's called the tunic of righteousness. So we encapsulated those wisdom strategies into um, avoiding negative milestones. Understanding what the path of death is, what the path of life is, and how there are going to be milestones along the negative path. There are going to be milestones along the positive path. And on top of that, we are right now going to try to identify the repentance strategies to come out of the negative path. Because Yahushua knew that categorically, like he used ABCs. And he was not dismissive of the situation. He didn't try to stick his head in the sand. Looking, looking like, oh, well, the problem of life is going to go over me. Well, I'm just going to go get, uh, I'm going to go watch a movie right now and eat popcorn. Maybe that summer is going to leave. No, he was, not, he was not as dumb as that. No way. He understood something was about to happen right now to blow the plan of redemption. That's not going to happen to me. I'm going to push against it. And we identified major milestones along the path of death. Last week, as milestone negative one is going to be the carnal mind. Based on the evidence of Romans chapter 8, and you can see how that happened to Jesus. Peter and the disciples pushed all their carnality on the master, talking about things that are opposite to the plan of God for the moment. And the carnal mind resulted in hostility, or what we call negative 2, which is going to be a carnal will or an evil desire. Based on the evidence of James chapter 1, and verse 13 to verse 15, and Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. And then carnal, carnal will is going to become carnal emotions which are going to be temptations. And if temptations are not overcome, they become sin, willful disobedience, treason, or rebellion against a good God, which will lead to death. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 talks about that. And if the believer doesn't repent of that, then there are going to be uh, significant ramifications in their circumstances called misfortunes. Misfortunes pursue sinners. Prosperity is the reward of righteous. There are going to be afflictions and oppressions that Yahushua paid for on the cross of Calvary if the believer does not repent and repeat the test quickly to download the inheritance that he traded for the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes, the pride of life. That's the way it occurs. And people live in the circuit of misfortune and affliction and sin of misfortune and afflictions. And if they were to die physically in that mode, they become eligible for a bad resurrection. Or, if it is during the season of the next rapture, failure to qualify for the good resurrection after a temporary cessation of physical existence, and, of course, they're going to miss the rapture in that mode, and this is the result of living a physical life of disobedience and death on the side of eternity. It's going to be equivalent to going to hell after leaving this side of eternity. 
And there, milestone number seven is going to be the second death, which is incarceration into the lake of fire. Uh, permanent separation from the presence of God, based on the evidence of Revelation 20, verse 14. But if you're listening to me right now, there is hope for you. You're not a negative six. You're not a negative seven just yet. Why? Because you can listen to me. Because you can hear what I'm saying. Now, the guys who get a negative six, negative seven, they can't hear what I'm saying. They're, they're going on the side of eternity. But if you can hear what I'm talking about, you may even be a negative five, you can turn back. You may be a negative four, you can turn back. You may be a negative three, you can turn back. You may be a negative two, you can turn back. You may be a negative one, you can turn back. And for your information, if you are a believer following through this ministry, these milestones along the negative path, are not your default to start with. If you get here, it's got someone pushed you there. Your default is the path of life. And we're going to be talking about later next week how to soar, how to mount on your wings like an eagle, staying predominantly along the path of life. That's where you belong. But peradventure, some Peter were to sneak into your world and push you down to the negative path, which can occur in less than a few hours. <laughs> In the case of Jesus, I, I believe that that occurred in less than four hours. Because Yahushua wouldn't stay 24 hours with a sorrowful mind. He wouldn't stay that. No, no, no. He would have done something with it. But Peter pushed the master down in less than a day. He can occur to you as well. If you're not uh, smart enough. Some people were to come into your world and they started calling you. And uh, some sibling or some... <laughs> so in this it's the same, but tap, 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 tap. Before you know, they look all their problems on you. And you leave that conversation, it would turn to a one hour, two hour conversation, man. You feel like jumping off the cliff, killing yourself right now because your mind is sorrowful. <laughs> but that's not a right reaction. No, no, no. You learn from Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane right now. Don't kill yourself just yet. God just wants more oil on you. That's the reason he allowed Peter to come. But when he comes, so you got to know what to do. Come on now. The devil starts telling you, well, you can't carry on to do what God told you to do. Can't you see how difficult it is? Now, look how the whole world's against you. Everybody, nobody likes you. Come on now. Look at what they're telling you. Oh, they're telling you. Come on. Why don't you give up? And then you start hearing all of that. It seems like, well, it's just the weight of the world and my emotions right now. Man, it's trying to kill me. You have an example in the Lord. <laughs> Go turn to Matthew chapter 26. Turn to your study notes. Look at it with prepared strategies over there and then blast off those those, those lies of the enemy and push incense into your mind. Oh, but I don't even feel like praying right now. Well, that's understandable. Get your phone. <laughs> God's blessed him with a ton of resources on his phone, on this, in, this, in his ministry. You're going to turn to that sanctification prayers and just go ahead and lie down a little bit. If you want to sleep, it's okay. Just go ahead and lie down and pull the phone close to your ears. Scroll to supplication and intercession quickly over there for the next 20 minutes. Let it keep on pushing incense into your mind a little bit while you're lying down sleeping like a giant. <laughs> lying down like a sleeping giant over there. And then he starts to pray in front of you. He started playing your mind over there. You're pushing out incense. That incense is going to start to clip the operation of demonic talking to you. And you do it for a few minutes over there. By the grace of God, the strength of Israel is not going to lie to you. The devil's going to shut up. Because he has no defenses for incense. You push significant instances, you're going to padlock his operation so you can see clearly. Now, when you see clearly, you have no strength right now. You go ahead and you pray by yourself. One time and two times and three times. Come on now. You got your emotions back. The sorrow is cast out of your emotions. You're sick and I dare the eye to stop. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. I can see you're trying to block my blessing. You're trying to steal. You're trying to kill. You're trying to destroy. You have no place in my territory. I cast you out. Sit and leave right now in the name of Jesus. You're going to see clearly to behold the joy behind the cross through those wisdom strategies. Again, who taught us that? Yahushua, the one you call Jesus. Oh, but I never saw that before in my Bible. Well, turn to Matthew chapter 26 right now and turn off those TV preachers a little bit. And then you're going to read yourself. Oh, that's true. This is what the master did. Correct. You're going to be on the same page with me. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. So we are going to be talking deeper into repentance strategies right now. If peradventure, you get pushed down to the negative milestone. Again, remember, this is not your default. 
You don't live in a negative forever. <laughs> no, 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 no. But some way, somehow, something, some things happen, and there's a Peter who's snarking on you, man, and they, they loaded all the problems of the world on you and dragged you down. Well, the fact that your emotions are tanked right now does not necessarily mean that you're going to fall into treason and lose an anointing, lose your blessing. No. Why? Because your spirit. You are predominantly a recreated human spirit. You're not your emotions. You're not your mind. You're not your will. You're not your body either. You are a spirit. And if you let the strength of the human spirit come out of you, you can tame those negative emotions. Emotions may be sorrowful. I don't care. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by the word, by what I hear. I'm moved only by what the word of God says about me. You let your spirit gain ascendancy over your emotions. You can tame your emotions with the force of a strong, recreated human spirit. But did you hear what I said? Strong, recreated human spirit. Letting you know you got to be strong on the outside, on the inside. Because if you falter in a time of adversity, how small is your strength? You got to get strength over here in your spirit, in your core, in your being, in your inner being. You got to be strong on the inside. So how do you get strong on the inside? We get strong on the inside by getting exposed to the sincere milk of the word, sincere meat of the word, delight in it, and eating your spiritual food properly. And God's helping us in this ministry. We just created something called a food timetable right now. Everybody on the call, make sure you accept those invitations. You are going to see at least 18 invitations sent to your Gmail or to your mail, make sure you accept all those food timetable invitations. They are going to be quick reminders for you all through the day, all through the week. Well, it's time to take my breakfast right now. It's time for lunch. It's time for dinner. From Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all through, all around. I spent hours all through yesterday to create that food timetable. Accept that invitation. Put it on your phone. So that when you're going through the business of your waking hours and everything, you have not had time to eat your spiritual meal. Something's going to flash in front of you. Time for breakfast. Time for lunch. And you're going to click on that button. You're going to see exactly what your spirit is going to need. At that time, you go ahead and you expose yourself to it. You get your spiritual energy. And you do that day in, day out, week in, week out. They are going to give you some spiritual stamina in your spirit. Waiting for your emotions to get amplified. And for those amplified emotions to be defeated so you can get a crown. That's the way it works. But if you're just goofing off, you're not going to eat spiritually. At the back of your heart, you're thinking about getting entertained. Or you're thinking about, you know, you don't want to take these things seriously. You're going to get weak spiritually. And the devil's going to keep watching for you. Oh well, yeah, he's weak right now. Then he sends Peter into your world. They talked and they looted all their problems to you. Your emotions get down. Your spirit does not, doesn't even have enough strength to remember any of these things we're talking about. That's the way it works. And then you fall in treason. You, you curse God in your heart. Even though nobody's looking at you, we're just going to be cool and sing as well. The pride of life, lost the flesh, lost life, they defeat you. You lose an inheritance. The devil jumps to your circumstances, steals your blessing away. That's the way it works. The Bible says, do not be ignorant of the devices of the enemy. You got to be as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. Why? Wise virgin strategies. So you've got to know what to do if that were to happen to you. Tunics 1 and 2 is going to tell you what to do if that were to happen to you. Tunics 3 and 4 is going to tell you how to soar along the path of life. Repentance strategies. What are those repentance strategies? If I find myself in a carnal mind, what do I need to do? If I find myself in a carnal will, hostility against God, what do I do? Well, I got it encapsulated in this chart, which I'm going to share with you right now. So watch alongside with me. Hallelujah. All right, praise the name of the Lord. I'm going to be can see my chart on the board right now. Can you see this beautiful table on the board? It's called Repentance Strategies from a carnal mind, a carnal will, or hostile will. 
mild temptations, intense temptations, treason and afflictions. You can turn back. You can turn back from any of this, any of these milestones you find yourself with the tunic of righteousness, wisdom strategies. Well, what's a carnal mind? A carnal mind is going to be a situation where your mind has been godless, not necessarily sinful. If I see myself extensively just not talking about God when I'm in a carnal mind, well, how do I know that? Well, there's going to be darkness in my mind. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end, is going to lead to death, which means that all the while they thought that well, they were traveling down along a, a honky-dory path. Well, this strategy is going to work for me. You're deceived. And then the Bible says there is no peace for the wicked. It says the carnal mind is death, but the spiritual mind is life and peace. So no peace in this category. So when your peace meter is getting low, there's a lot of confusion and darkness in the mind. Carnal mind. And the way that happened was godlessness. Well, godlessness through a conversation, a godless conversation, godless chores, what that means is you're doing your chores without acknowledging God in all your ways. You're doing your studies without acknowledging God. You do mathematics and computer science and programming, program management or project management, whatever you're doing. Just God is on the back burner. Well, this is going to put you down in the path and it starts with a common mind. So if I see all these indicators in my mind, I am on my way to hell. That's what the Bible says. Oh, come on now. I'm a man of you too harsh. No, a carnal mind, that's not, no. Did you read the book of Romans, which is the carnal mind is going to lead to death? Oh, no, but I believe I'm a man of faith. No, there's, there is no death in my, no, there is no death in me. No, I live my life every time. No, that's not the way faith operates. Stop being stupid. Faith's not going to use your loud confessions to modify the conditions of the word. The Romans chapter 8 says the carnal mind will lead to death. Now, if you believe in Jesus, you call Jesus your Lord, you are going to believe that scripture. You're going to believe that in my mind is getting carnal, and I'm getting ready to die right now. And that death over there is not just physical death or cessation of physical existence. It's going to be, I'm getting ready to fall into treason and journey down to the path of hell. You're going to believe that. Now, oh, but that's maybe confession if I believe that. No, that's not maybe confession because if you really believe that, you're going to do whatever is necessary to make sure that your mind is not carnal. You're going to do whatever is necessary to make sure your mind is not godless. You're going to do whatever is necessary to make sure that you acknowledge God in all your ways so you can fly to here. The person who believes that is the person who's in faith. And our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, they just act irrational, illogical, and they say they're operating in faith. Hogwash. Toss away that philosophy. Faith is going to believe the conditions of the word and start making plans to abide by those conditions so they can bless the consequence of it. Come on, my godless, darkness, deception, incomplete revelation, no peace, confusion, my mind is calm. So how do I turn back? When I start seeing those indicators, well, I am going to do what we call the what aspect of the water of the word. We did, an, we did an extensive study of spiritual groceries. Spiritual groceries, uh, water is going to let you well And in the situation when you're just godless, uh, you're not necessarily hostile to God just yet. You can start to think about the status of Yahushua as he is seated at the right hand of the Father right now. What, you're, what are you going to do? Get yourself and get in a godly, godly conversation. Identify the source of attack. If it's a video, go get an opposite of that. Video for video, audio for audio, text for text, conversation for conversation. You got to engage in an ungodly conversation. Go get engaged in a godly conversation through a video, through an audio, through a text message, through whatever pushed you down over there. We need that study in the overcomer secret. It's going to shift your, your antenna back in the direction of positive thoughts. You do that for the requisite amount of time that you spent in godless chatter to push you down negative one, you're going to see yourself, you're going to fly out of it immediately. 
All of a sudden, there's going to be peace in your mind. Spiritual mind is going to lead to life and peace. You're not peace in your mind is a consequence of spiritual exercise, journeying right now in the direction of heaven. No more in the direction of hell. But if I was stupid a little bit, and I didn't catch myself really quickly, I'm going to get here to negative two. The word of God says that the carnal mind is hostile to God. He does not submit to God, and watch this, it cannot. Read Romans chapter 8 from verse 6 downwards. It says, once the mind is, is godless, you're stripped of the ability to listen to God. You're going to be hostile to God. Well, that's negative too. It's called hostility. Well, just because of godlessness. Now, when that happens to you, these are the repentance strategies. You're going to start considering the why aspect of the water of the word. Start considering the gains associated with doing things God's way, the losses associated with not doing things God's way. And then you're going to do everything over here as well in milestone negative one. So there are two things you got to do right now, the milestone strategies and negative two and the negative one. But if I don't do something with hostility, hostility is going to lead to temptations right now. And there are two categories of temptations. I call them mild temptations and intense temptations. How? We learned that from Jesus. Yahushua was in mild temptations in the wilderness of temptation experience. And he was in intense temptations in the Garden of Gethsemane. In the wilderness experience, his emotions were not super amplified. There was no sorrow attacked to his emotions. When the devil started telling him, Tell, turn the stone to bread. He wasn't really sorrowful over there. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, many intense temptations, there was sorrow attached right now. So how do you journey away from mild temptations? You're going to imitate Yahushua's strategy in the wilderness. What did Jesus do? Yahushua replied with a complete counsel of the word of God, which the devil was trying to twist. And then he did everything above. The angels came and had godly conversations with Yahushua in the wilderness of, wilderness of temptation experience. The devil came around and said, well, uh, uh, if you're the son of God, turn the stone to bread. And that looks like, well, that's a no-brainer right now. I mean, I've been fasting for about 40 days. And that's not, not a problem now. I'm going to turn this into bread and eat something in my body. But Yahushua knew deeply. Him falling for that temptation is going to be falling for the loss of the flesh. And believing a lie that all it takes to survive is eating. If I don't eat, I'm going to die. Yahushua said that's not correct. <laughs> what kills you is not hunger. A starvation. What kills you is because you refuse to do the will of God. Yet who should believe that firmly? Wow. <laughs> Somebody clap for the man. Give the master a round of applause over there. Yet who should say, No man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In other words, just because I'm hungry right now and I refuse to eat, I'm not going to die because of that. I die because God is going to let me die. In quote. So what am I going to do? I'm going to talk to God. God, is it going to be okay for me to turn the stone to bread and then I can eat it and then I'm going to get satisfied. But without God telling me to do that, Lucifer, I'm not going to do it. Right? He's not using, he's not going to use his resources for the lust of the flesh. That was the test in the garden, in the wilderness temptation. Are you that smart to detect a temptation coming on you? God wants to see, what well, if I put all these loads of anointing on you, will you use it to gratify the desires of the flesh? And Yahushua said, no, I'm not going to do that. Satan, get me behind. So Satan falls. He tried to paint the picture of God, the picture of the word of God in a bad light. Yahushua, through the teaching that, that he'd been through, he'd been through the ODP multiple times over. He brought a complete counsel of the words. And I <laughs> said, I saw your tail over there. I'm going to call your tail, little loser, little, little loser Lucifer. I cast you out. You overcame temptation by a complete counsel of the word of God. And then he did all the above. I will go ahead and jump off the cliff. Didn't the word of God say that, well, God's going to give his angels charge over you? And the illusion said, no. But not the scripture says, don't tempt the Lord your God. You're trying to do that just for showy reasons to let people know I got super, supernatural power right now. That's going to be the proud of life. I'm not doing that. Satan, get thee behind. In all those three occasions, we can see that Jesus came up with a complete counsel of the word of God, 
which diffused the tension of temptation. That's how you overcome mild temptations. But if I'm kind of stupid and I journey past mild temptations and I find myself in intense temptations, then I am going to be really close to treason right now. Then I got to do what Jesus did in the garden gets me. In this mode, there is going to be sorrow attached to my soul, to my emotions. Now, simply replying with the word of God, trying to bind them, is not going to work anymore. Why? Because there's, there's sorrow right now. I can't see clearly. Well, that's why you need to turn to the strength of the recreated human spirit. Go to what we call praying sanctification scriptures. Let incense, significant incense, come out of your mind and push that sorrow away so you can see clearly. You do it the first time, the second time, the third time. Come on, you can see it clearly right now. Then you're going to push the devil away and say, my body, I can see what you're talking about right now. I am not going to abort God's plan for my life. I consider the joy behind the cross. I consider the, the crown after the cross. And I'm going to carry my cross. Say, my, I curse you in the name of Jesus. Get, get thee behind me. Say, my body, get out of here. You're going to shine a complete castle of the word after incense as defeated sorrow in your mind so you can see clearly. Then you're going to do monster number two, monster number one, you're going to have it. But if for some reason I'm still stupid and mild temptations, intense temptations, and boom, I fall into treason right now. Well, don't go kill yourself just yet. You violate God's instruction to you, but God still loves you. Repent of it in less than 30 seconds. Through 1 John 1, 9, Hebrews 9, 13, and 14. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How much more shall the blood of Christ purge our consciences from dead works so we can serve the living God? Apply the blood. You say, Father, I missed it. I blew this thing. I blew it. Come on, Father, please forgive me. And you confess, you receive your forgiveness less than 30 seconds because you don't want to die in that mode of treason. You can go to hell, even though you're speaking tongues. <laughs> cool. So the recommendation is less than 30 seconds. You get rid of treason right there and there. When you lose the joy of your salvation, you're going to lose treason. When you start experiencing the fears and the emotions that Adam and Eve were experiencing in the Garden of, Garden of Eden, when they found the treason, you know that you found the treason too. How do you get rid of that? Repent of it. Call it a sin. You say, Father, I repent of this treason. Please forgive me in the name of Yahushua. You repent of it. Now you're going to go into the Garden of Gethsemane and experience. Push out incense into your mind so you can still see what God is trying to tell you to do. And after that, you are going to resist the devil and then do negative to negative, you're going to come out of it. But lots of our brothers, they, they're not even taught properly about the concept of repentance. So they, <laughs> they drink iniquity every day. <laughs> There's a scripture like that. It says you drink sin like water every day. They, so they are going to be in the circuit of afflictions right now in negative five. That's what that's called. Because misfortunes go pursue sinners. They are going to see the oppression of sin and death and sickness and diseases, poverty, lack of insufficiency, fears, anxiety, death and unbelief, mishaps and accidents, and all manners of evils and issues that Yahushua paid for on the cross of Calvary are going to be attendants to their stories in negative five. And if you find yourself in that situation, you still have breath in your nostrils. No reason trying to kill, kill yourself just yet. No, don't kill yourself. What are you going to do? You're going to justify God in your heart? Realize that God's been doing his business for eons of years before you came to be. And certify God has been right. And then you're going to say, Father, I'm sorry, where am I missing it? And if you judge yourself, the word of God says you're not going to be judged. But I'll let you know you're going to take yourself as the accused to your own courtroom and you are going to be the judge. And you shine the light of the word of God in you. You point, you point that finger and say, no, you did something wrong over here, boy. You change it right now in the name of Jesus. Say, yes, sir, I change it. I ask for forgiveness and I receive my forgiveness by faith in the name of Jesus right now. You repent like that, you are forgiven. You plead the blood of Jesus, the guilt gets removed from your conscience in less than 30 seconds. It's like magic. It works every time. You come out of afflictions, come out of treason, come out of temptations, come out of negative two, and then come out of negative one and be on the path of life, which is where you belong. Hallelujah. Did you see how technical this repentance strategies are? And yet, Yahushua knew them as his ABCs. These are what he called his ways. 
This is what he called the yoke of the master. He never journeyed down to negative four, but what kept him from negative four are these critical understandings. He won't let somebody make his mind godless. He knew that like his ABCs. Look at what happened, how Jesus handled the situation with the woman at the well. The woman came over there and started having a godly, godless conversation with Yahushua. Yahushua said, give me water. He said, well, I don't have any water. And I don't know what else she talked about. Yahushua used the puddle literally to keep his mind straight. He switched the conversation around. He said, go call your husband over here. When I don't have any husband, well, you've had five. Like you're, just, <laughs> you're just a rough young woman. You'll go do something. Oh, how did he know that? Well, he started calling me. Well, believe me, woman, he got his spirit. Those who worship him must worship his spirit. He changed that conversation from a carnal conversation, carnal and godless conversation of getting water from the well. He switched it around to God his spirit. And those who worship him must worship him. Why is he doing that? Because <laughs> he doesn't want his mind to net me. He knew that. That's the way he operated for the most part. And it was a very, very uh, um, sparse situation that occurred with Peter for Peter to drag the master down from negative 1 to negative 3.9. Very, very rare occasion. But even in that, he knew exactly what to do to fly out of it. Can we learn from the master? Hallelujah. If you want to learn from the master, give me a thumbs up over there. Salute the master once again for me. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings. The risen Savior, Yahushua. He deserves your highest praises right now. Put your hands together. Bless the name of the Lord. Say thank you, Lord. Yes, sir, forever. Give him glory right now. If you're watching with me, put your hands together on that child and say yes to the master. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Did you get something from it? Come on now. We're going to press this baby right and put scriptures around it. Still more. Lord, hallelujah. All right, so let's go ahead and turn to uh, page 104 right now. We're going to see this repentance strategies. So repent from a common mind. Well, how do you do that? Avoid godless chat. Well, which scripture says that? Well, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Um, and if you will remember that scripture, it's a popular scripture, but not just got, just, we just gloss over it like it's not important. But we think it's important, <laughs> and we want to read it. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 16. Look, look over here. It says, avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. You see over there. Godless. Oh, but I'm not ungodly just yet. Yeah, I know. But if you stay in a godless chat, a godless conversation, you are going to become more and more ungodly. Okay. Now, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 or 2 is going to tell you what to do that, to avoid godless chat. It says you put your mind smack on things of the Spirit. Take a look at it. Colossians chapter 3, from verse 1, it says, Since then you've been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above. Where Christ is seated on the right hand of the Father. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly or carnal things. And that includes when you're doing your job as well. That includes when you're going to the grocery store. That includes when you are studying mathematics or English or whatever. Put God in it. Don't be secular. Be biblical. That's the reason we set up the HHA like that. And this generation per capita is so dumb, they're going to start telling you, well, that's your religion. Just put it outside over there. You know, you talk about God when you're in church. You know, that's your religion right now. You know, we're in school. You're not going to be talking about God. God in school. Well, you've got to understand that a human soul was not designed to operate that way because you were created by the God that you are trying to, to discount. Your secularism is trying to discount the author of life who gives you life and breath to let you know that you don't need God. But that's, that's a lie. You were created for it. Without God in your mind significantly, your body is going to implode. Your body is literally not going to function properly because there's not going to be peace in your mind. And when your mind is not at peace, it's going to become like Decay to your body. And the whole way to get peace is to have a spiritual mind. A spiritual mind is going to lead to life and peace. When your mind is godless, there is no peace over there. 
You do not appease. You're going to be hostile to God. You can't submit to God. You're going to form the treason. There's going to be death. Attacking your circumstances. Attacking your body. Attacking your mind. There's no peace. So you're going to go down to pee. No. Godlessness canceled. So how do you do that? Acknowledge God both in mundane and non-mundane activities by being baptized into the Messiah, the Holy Spirit, and the Father. Fellowshipping with God through what we call podil for Dylan to enforce KJR for KOG. Well, how do we know that? Well, you turn right now to Proverbs chapter 18. In Proverbs chapter 18, God's going to tell you to acknowledge the Lord in all of your ways. No, no, no. That's Proverbs chapter 3. But right now, let's look at Proverbs chapter 18. We're going to get there. Proverbs 18, let's see. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Proverbs 18 and in verse 10. It says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous one and two, then they are safe. Correct. So your safety is going to be in the name of the Lord. We talked about all of that. It's going to be baptized in the Messiah. But look at Proverbs chapter 3 right now. In Proverbs chapter 3, glory to God. In verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Well, you want to have a straight path? Now, the twisted, confused path along the path of death is going to start with you acknowledging the Lord in all your ways. And we said a few weeks ago that acknowledging the Lord in all your ways is going to mean you go on purpose, intentionally, to the Holy Spirit, asking him for guidance in everything you do. Because some of our brothers, they think acknowledging the Lord in all my ways is to recognize the Holy Spirit as a piece of furniture in my home. No, it goes beyond that. But when I know the Holy Spirit, I accept the Lord before me because he's at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Well, correct. That's the start of it. But it doesn't stop at that. What are you doing with the Lord that you said before you? Are you talking to him? Are you receiving instructions from him? Are you obeying the instructions given you? Oh, no, but I just said the Lord. But you're treated like a piece of furniture. That's not acknowledging the Lord in all your ways. No, you go to him on purpose, God. How many uh, bullion cubes do I need to put in that potato? Yes. Oh, come on, you're acting funny right now. The Holy Spirit doesn't care. No. The deeper reason why you need to do that is to engage in the Holy Spirit. So the voice of the Holy Spirit, which is going to be the voice of God to you, can keep you on the path of life. There's really nothing in the potatoes, correct? But there is something in the voice of God that's going to be telling you how to cook your potatoes. And we put this put your food time to. You're going to see it right now. You're going to see that exercise over there, staying baptized. You're going to walk through that little play something. You're going to say, you talk to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's going to talk back to you. You're going to listen. You're going to judge with righteousness, and you can do what Holy Spirit tells you to keep you on the path of life. Make sure you accept those invitations. It's called full time table from Heroes Mark. Oh, but I mean, uh, when I when I try to to listen to the Holy Spirit, I missed it. Oh, I'm feeling bad because of that. And you quit. You stop talking to the Holy Spirit because you you missed it. Okay, what about the times that you got it? Why can't you fix it all the time? That well, well, out of ten times, maybe five out of ten times, I got it. I got it. I, well, five, I missed. It. Okay, so why don't you fix it on the five out of ten times that you got when the Holy Spirit was talking to you? You get better by practice, man. You, well, the question you should be asking is why did I miss it? And the answer is going to be in John five thirty. You missed it because you weren't judging based on righteousness. That's how you missed it. If you were a judge based on righteousness, you should have asked a question. How is this decision? Or what I thought I got from the Holy Spirit, how will this decision help me to be more right with the Father? To help God's creation to be more right with the Father. That's how you're going to know this is the Holy Spirit. This is Lucifer talking to him. Say, shut up. The Holy Spirit is going to shine. And you're going to latch into it. But all of that can happen in less than a few seconds if you've trained your ears to hear when God is talking to you. It's called being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So don't get discouraged, man. You need the Holy Spirit to journey and stay along the path of life to keep you peaceful in your mind. Acknowledge the Lord in all your ways. 
Wash your mind and renew your mind with the what aspect of the word of God. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. The wash basin ceremony. We talked about the tabernacle of Moses, the faith of a priest. Do this. Think about the what aspect of the status of Yahushua. So you do all that, you're going to come out of negative one by the grace of God. But if I don't do that, I get into a carnal will right now, which is hostility against God. What am I going to do? Quench the thirst of your will with the whys and the why nots of the water of the word. We did an extensive study. We're going to start considering, well, the Bible says right now, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 4, wealth is going to be worthless in a season of wrath. But righteousness is going to deliver from death. Well, I got to make sure I grow my rightness relationship with the Father right now in this season of darkness. Or I'm just going to be in booster shots upon booster shots and booster shots upon booster shots like everybody else. Well, I want something better for me. So, <laughs> Father, what can I do? What can I do to help you? Um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You want me to do this? You're going to think about that. All that hostility is going to disappear. Oh, what are you talking about? So you're not taking booster shots, no. I live on a high plane. It's called spiritual vaccination. Y'all can go, you can go take your booster shots until the immu immunity of your body gets completely destroyed. And in that moment, the pale horse rider is going to get you. But no, I'm not doing that. Right from the back, I told everybody around me, this is our spiritual vaccination. Proverbs 11, 4. Wealth is going to be worthless in a season of wrath. That means medical science is going to be worthless in the season of wrath. That means the financial community is going to be worthless in the season of wrath. And some dingoes thought I was an extremist and they were like, no, we found vaccination right now. We're going to do it. So their poor vaccination is not working. They're like, no, we're going to do booster shots. Okay, you do booster shots, it's not going to work. Well, we're going to do another booster shot. Yeah, you keep on doing that. Keep doing that. <laughs> keep doing it until your body dies. And you're going to be part of that. Seal for a statistic that's going to be the going to wipe that. No. There's no way around this. you got to make sure you get right. The Father was going to keep you safe. And you live supernatural and natural all through the days. You keep your body safe over there. Keep listening to the Father. You start thinking like that. You're not going to be hostile to God anymore. <laughs> that's how to come out of negative two. Remind yourself the hope of salvation. Deuteronomy chapter 28 from verse 1 to 68. Repent of a carnal mind subsequently. But if I don't do something with it and I get down to carnal emotions right now, which may be broken down into mild temptations and intense temptations. This is when the devil starts to talk to me right now while because my mind, my will had been hostile all the while. Well, if it's the mild temptation experience, we call that negative 3.0 to negative 3.49. And the example is going to be Yahushua in the wilderness of, wilderness of temptation experience. Reply with a complete understanding of, of the counsel of the word of God. Luke chapter 4 from verse 3 to verse 13. You're going to see what Jesus did over there to overcome. Yahushua said, it is written. It is written. It is written. Sit and get thee behind in the name of Jesus. And then you're going to repent of a carnal will and a carnal mind milestones. Negative to negative one. You're going to be out of the path of death. But if I don't do something with it and I get that to intense temptations, which is going to be classified in our ODP studies as negative 3.5 to negative 3.99, you're going to have to do what Yahushua did first in the Garden of Gethsemane to blast away the sorrow attaching to his emotions right now. Why? Because you are a spirit predominantly. You're not your body. You're not your emotions. But you, you must not be eating well before you can do that, correct? Yes, that's the reason food timetable is important. You've got to be eating well. Breakfast and lunch and dinner. Breakfast, lunch and dinner. Uh, but I do that already. No, I'm talking spiritually now. Come on. <laughs> what are you going to do? You're going to pray like Yahushua and employ complete exercise of faith principles like a priest. After the tabernacle of Moses, get that sanctification prayer over there. While Yahushua did in Matthew 26 from verse 36 to 45, and then repents of 3.0, repents of negative 2, negative 1, and fly back to possibly 4 in the milestones along the path of life. But if I don't do something with not fall into treason, well, just like I said before, don't be like Judas right now. Don't hang yourself. The Father still needs you. He's invested a lot into you, and he wants to reap a harvest of righteousness from your spirit. So God needs you come back home. Well, how do you do that? 
God's going to start that process with a conviction of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God says the Holy Spirit is going to convict the world of their sins. The Holy Spirit is going to be telling you right now there is no peace for the wicked. And it's going to tell you, no, hey boy, you missed it over there. You've got to repent right now. So when that starts to come to you, that is what we call God's first move. And then that is a token of God's love for you to give you seeing eyes and hearing ears and understanding heart. That's a token of God's love for you. Because some people didn't even have eyes to see anymore. And that's a dangerous place to see, to be. But if God is convicting your heart and telling you, well, there's something wrong over you, go push it down, then your move is going to, call, going to be called man's move, which is going to be a response in honesty, humility, and faith. What's the honesty part of it? You're going to acknowledge the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Take yourself convicted to your courtroom. See yourself as the judge and say, I'm wrong. Don't cover it up. Don't give excuses. Oh, but look at what they did. No, 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 no. That's not the time to say that. Come on now. Oh, if this didn't happen, then this wouldn't happen. No, don't say that. Yes, Lord, you're right. I'm wrong. That's honesty. And then humility is going to say, I, is going to be, I decide to make a turn right now. You're going to reference what happened to, to Peter in Matthew 26, 75. He applied humility. The Holy Spirit convicted him. You, you denied the Lord right now. Boy, you got to repent of that. And because of the words of Jesus, which were in him, he chose the path of humility. He repented while Judas went and hanged himself. Find a scripture that was violated, let it give you faith. So, well, the Bible says, well, touch nothing unclean. I touch something unclean right now, Father. I, I, I repent of this right now. Please forgive me. Then you move into faith right now to receive forgiveness by faith. Turn to 1 John 1, 9, Hebrews 9, 13, and 14, Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. See Yahushua as your advocate and the Father as the judge declaring that you are forgiven. The blood of Jesus is going to go in operation. It's going to cleanse your spirit so you can serve living God properly. And you can do this process in less than 30 seconds. Why 30 seconds? Because we don't want to die with truth in our hearts. And I say it again. The Lutheran gospel may not like it. You die with treason in your heart you go to hell. I don't care how many tongues you've spoken all through your ears. You die pushing against the conviction of the Holy Spirit. There is no place for treason in heaven. Believe that firmly and steer, and steer far away from anything remotely close to negative four design systems so the tunic of righteousness around your story. Um, so you're going to do that. Repent. Repent of negative three, negative two, negative one, and fly up to positive four. But some of our friends may not know how to do that and they find themselves in negative five. What am I going to do then? There's going to be circumstances. There are going to be afflictions in my circumstances right now. Justify God in your heart. Remind yourself that a curse causeless shall not lie. Proverbs 26 and verse 2. If there are significant oppressions and afflictions in my circumstances, then things are not getting better. If things are getting better, it means you're coming out of it. But if things are getting escalated, they're getting worse and worse and worse. And if God's trying to get your attention and you're not listening to something, justify God in your heart. Say, Father, you're right. I'm wrong. If you're not born again, repent of the first sin of refusing to submit to the Lordship of Jesus and subsequently all the sins. Matthew chapter 7 from verse 21 is going to come to play. It says, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Learn from the wisdom strategies by subscribing to Here's My Online Discipleship Program through pharmacy and milk and mineral water combination meals. You're going to be on the same page with everybody. You get born again. But if you're born again and you still find yourself in treason, repent of that particular sin action of a dead work and employ prior strategies talked about for negative one, and negative four, and negative three, and negative two, and you're going to come, come out and then fix your tunic where your tunic, your wisdom is kind of sold, right? And you fix it. Looking at, oh, that's, that's what I do during my waking moments. That's the reason the devil can push me down to negative four. I'm not eating well, or, or maybe I'm not praying properly, or I'm hanging out from affinities with the Lucan gospel, because that's the Lucan gospel in my heart. Well, I repent of that right now, cancel it in the name of Jesus. Then clean up your tunic and be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove by, as a dove by the grace of God. This is tunic of righteousness, part 
to somebody did you get something from it and all this repentance strategies of course they are going to be encapsulated in the table talked about on page one zero one zero seven of your study notes you're going to see it over there and just like i said last year at your stage of this odp this is the most important study for you somebody just getting started with the odp the most important study for them is the pharmacy section of the work they got to be well grounded in what we call honesty, humility, and faith. But at your stage right now, the ODP, you know HHF already. The most important thing for you right now is the tunic of righteousness. Wisdom. That's all it takes. Wisdom. What do I need to do to be wise? Don't be like a dumb dummy anymore. The carnal and the unbeliever, they have no future, leave them alone. You stay wise with the wisdom of the wise virgins right now. This is wisdom. Understand what it takes to get McConnell of mind. Don't, don't play around that territory anymore. You're going to lose your peace in that mode. You're going to lose your resources in that mode. Understand what it takes to be in the spiritual mind, spiritual will, and the life and abundance in your story. You're flying. Those who wait on the Lord will renew, renew their strength. Operate the bubble of peace, the bubble of joy like a river. Preserve your resources and conserve your resources with a tunic of righteousness, tragedies, tunic. Part two, did you get something from it? Saying to God, I am sure and I hope so. You got something from it. Put your hands together on the call with me. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord some glory right now. Give him thumbs up and say, thank you, Lord, for this understanding. Bless the name of the Lord with me if you got something with it. Something from it. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory to Jesus. Amen. All right. Uh, for the rest of our friends right now, we may want to... Um, connect with the Lord. Say, so, well, I, I never knew this before. <laughs> Which planet did you come from, brother? Well, <laughs> well, it's not me. I'm just as human as you. But all the glory to the name of the one who gives knowledge. It's, that's nothing special about me. <laughs> but bless the name of the Lord. Well, I want to get you started getting acquainted with the one you call Lord. The one I call Lord. Who I call Yahushua. And the way I like to do that is to turn to the most complete salvation scripture in the Bible which is Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Please listen. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles. And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Well, that passage of scripture lets us know that there are going to be two things that are categorically important to helping me to make it over to the kingdom of heaven. It's called calling Jesus Lord, Yeshua Lord, Yahushua Lord, Jason Lord, whatever name you call the reason Savior, call that person Master. Call that person to serve. That's the person I take orders from. I take my orders right now from the Lord who died and who was resurrected for me. I call him Yeshua. And then stop me to please the Father, you're going to do your way. Well, you want to make that decision? I'm going to ask you right now, pray this prayer right after me. Hallelujah. So, Lord Jesus, Yahushua, I realize that I've been a sinner, refusing to call you Lord, calling myself my own Lord. I repent of this sin. And I ask you to forgive me. I call you Lord, Master, Boss, and Savior. Please save me from my sins. I believe that you died, that you were resurrected from the dead to save me from my sins. Please give me a new heart. And with your help, with your grace, I will live to please the Father and make heaven my home. Thank you for saving me. I am born again in the name of Yahushua. Amen. Amen and amen.
Amen. Glory to God. If you pray that prayer with me sincerely from your heart, you are born again. Welcome to God's family. Congratulations. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Now, what happened on your inside is a spiritual surgical operation. What God did was to change your heart. It's a spiritual. God changed your spirit. The word of God says, the fair man is in Christ. He's a new creation. All things are past. And behold, all, all things have become new. Well, new and not necessarily from a physical standpoint. Your body is still the same. You have the same complexion of, of skin. You have the same nose, the same eyeballs. Nothing changed physical. But a lot has changed right in your heart. If you pray that prayer sincerely from your heart. You give God the legal basis, the father of all spirits, to give you a new spirit. That's what we call being born again. Now, if you pray that prayer, please let us know about it. Because the story is just going to get better right now. This is the start of your journey toward heaven. You're not in heaven just yet, but you've got to stay on this track. Now, what's going to help you to stay on this track is called teaching. It's called knowledge. It's called information. So if you let us know by sending us an email to info at heroesmart.com, we're going to package a bunch of resources free of charge and send it to you so you can strengthen your core and grow your faith and come along with the rest of us by the way. It's going to be info at heroesmart.com. You send us that email, we're going to send you resources to furnish your faith and strengthen your core by the grace of God. Congratulations. Welcome to God's family, my brothers and sisters. We love you. Welcome to God's family. Hallelujah. Um, for the rest of our friends and families who may want to take a copy of the study notes on the board, I'm going to step away from the screen for just a little bit right now to give you plenty of opportunities to pause your device, take a copy of the study notes on the board, and I'm going to be back right after 10 seconds. chance to take a copy of the study notes on the board. This is Tunica Rochester's part two. Thank you for staying on board with us. We're going to do part three next week. Please make sure you don't miss it. All right. But until that time, remember God cares about you. So do Yahushua is Lord. Stay blessed. In the name of Yahushua. Amen.